Lakeland Public Television presents Currents with host Ray Gildow. Sponsored by Nisswa Tax Service, offering tax preparation for individuals and businesses across from the City Hall in Nisswa and on the web at nisswatax.com. Hello again everyone and welcome to Lakeland Currents where today we're going to talk about all things fishing. My guest today is Tony Roach. Uh, Tony is uh, a professional fishing guide from Moose Lake, Minnesota and he has a very famous uh, great uncle, Gary Roach, who is known around Miss, uh, Minnesota as Mr. Walleye. Thank you, to, uh, thank you for being here, Gary. It's, uh, it's an honor to have a professional fisherman on the show. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Ray. Tell us a little bit about who you are. What is it that you do and how did you get into this business? And before you answer that, I want to say I, I have young guys all the time and sometimes young women asking me, how do you become a fishing guide? Well, you can maybe tell your story and that would give us an idea. Uh, you know, to be quite honest with you, I've always been into fishing. At a really young age, four or five years old, I knew what I wanted to be in life and that was a professional angler. You know, I. Uh, uh, my father was in fishing, you know, fished on the Mr. Walleye team uh, with Gary Fish. And what was your dad's first name? Mark Roach. Mark? <clears throat> fished a lot of tournaments. Um, obviously with Mr. Walleye, my uncle Gary being in the fishing industry, I always aspired to be, um, you know, kind of in that, those circles, if you will. And and um, it just was always a dream of mine. I, I, I got my start fishing, I guess, with my dad. My dad always took me fishing. We fished a lot of tournaments. Um, I started fishing walleye tournaments when I was 14 years old on Mille Lacs Lake. Fished every chance I got, I had growing up. I, I grew up on Moosehead Lake there, so it's a lake river system. So I got really got a vast knowledge of not only walleye fishing on the lake, but uh, fishing rivers as well and streams. And um, that passion just drove me as a individual, even at a young age, to uh, you know a, a blossoming of adult, if you will. I had a lot of friends that got away from fishing in, in high school and college, um, that just was never in my DNA. I just always fished, you know, I hunted and fished and it was my passion. It, like I said, it's what got me awake in the morning and kept me awake at night at times. And uh, uh, I got my first guiding start really at Lake of the Woods. I guided up on Flag Island Resort. Oh wow, um, way up there. <laughs> yeah, I had an opportunity to go up there. Um, a friend of mine's dad and family run, ran Flag Island Resort at the time and got to meet a bunch of great guides who I'm still in contact now with and uh, just that just kind of fueled that passion. I came back, um, I was still in college at the time when I was guiding up there, came back and really um, kind of got my foot in the door, if you will, in the fishing industry that way and then uh, shortly after that, uh, Gary asked me to be on the Mr. Walleye team. Um, that was a promotional team, you mm -hmm. know, that um, we went around and, and you know, you fish tournaments, you went to dealers, you, I started doing fish fries for Gary when I was in high school, so continued doing fish fries with his batter. I'd stand outside a, you know, a holiday sports or a Cub Foods or, you know, drive all over and, and do these fish fries, but it was, I was actually working in the fishing industry and loved doing it. I, to this day, I, I love having fish fries and people over and, and, uh, you Well, know, just call, I, I, I can find your house. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, that's kind of how I got my start. But really, when, when I was asked to be on Mr. Walleye team, I knew that that was a real in, inroad for me in, in getting in. And so I took full advantage of it. I, um, I called and emailed everybody I could. You know, it was around 2004, 2005. And um, I think at that time it was still making mainly phone calls. But I did send out a few emails and, and uh, had a few folks call me back, like Northland Fishing Tackle. Um, I remember Strike Master Augers had called me back, and so I just, I just said, hey, I, you know, I'm not looking for anything. I'm just looking to work events or anything you want me to do. I'll, I'll be there, and you know, so I'd go to these in-store promotions and kind of travel all over. And you know, you fast forward 11 years later, uh, here I am. I've been doing it for now over a decade full time, and uh, I love waking up every day, grabbing a cup of coffee, and going to the lake. Well, I would say you're one of the rising celebrities in the fishing industry, and I think one of your strengths is your humility, and, and I really mean that. Uh, you see lots of people who come and go in this industry, but they don't stay, and it seems that you have staying power. What, what did you major in in college? A number of different things. Uh, I, you know, ultimately I ended up majoring uh, in teaching because I wanted to 
teach so I could fish, and I figured uh, that was kind of the wrong reason to get into teaching. But it's really helped me become a good guide and a good teacher in the industry. Um, you know, being patient and and um, you know just educating people and showing people how I fish. Um, it was it was really um, a good thing that I, I took kind of that background. Uh, it, it did work out for the teaching world, but it definitely worked out, uh, you know, when I'm putting together presentations and seminars. And what area were you majoring in? What did you, were you in the high school level or elementary level? Uh, high school history, history? Uh, ninth grade history, I like American history. Um, did you teach at all? No, just student teaching. <clears throat> I, I and that was, enough to... <laughs> that, <laughs> that was enough to uh, know that I, I needed to look elsewhere as far as a career path. Um, I Again, it was... I knew I wanted to fish, but getting from point A, you know, to point B or C, you know, making that leap um, was the most difficult part. So I started my own guide business. I donated tons of trips and ran all over doing shows for free, and uh, you know, just traveled and helped out where I can. And I I still continue to do that today. I I love donating things to worthy causes and um, taking people fishing that normally wouldn't have an opportunity to fish. Um, I love to fish. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I, I think about it. It's who I am. Um, if I have a bad day on the water, I get home and, uh, you know, sometimes I get up at two o'clock in the morning and write down notes thinking, oh, okay, I didn't check this spot. Really? Or, yeah. Or, you know, uh, my <clears throat> wife, you know, I jokingly, she'll wake me up because I've been repeating like 19 <laughs> feet for an hour or something, but it, it does consume me. Uh, even when I've had a good day, you know, you, you there's just things that drive me. There's certain patterns that I get on, and I'm I'm really a multi-species angler. I, I make my living fishing walleyes and perch and smallmouth bass a lot of times on Mille Lacs Lake, but I really get into certain patterns, whether it's bass fishing top water or drop shot for smallmouth or even pan fish. You know, when, when I get a day off, I go pan fishing all the time with my kids, and there's certain pan fish patterns that I get on that I can't stop thinking about it. How do I perfect it? How do I make it better? How can I improve my boat control to put more of them in the boat? Um, I know it sounds weird, but that's kind of what drives me as a person uh, and as an angler. You know, uh, you sound a lot like a young Al or Ron Linder because that's how they were in their early years. Uh, I can remember them talking about laying in a, in a creek, even just watching fish to see how their behavior was. And I think if you look at our history uh, in the fishing industry, the, the pioneers are people who had that passion. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the everyday guy who just will go out when the weather's nice. And uh, it's people who have a passion like that. And I don't think that younger people who are looking at the industry realize the expense of it now. Mm -hmm. It's a very expensive business to get into, isn't it? Could you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I... Uh, um it is expensive. I mean, boats are expensive, trucks are expensive, insurance. You, you know, we talked off air about um, you know all the things that make a you know family tick with healthcare insurance and uh, rising healthcare costs. But yeah, it, it's a uh, um, it, it's hard to just jump in a boat and say uh, you know I'm going to go fishing or be a fishing guide or be a tournament angler. There's a lot that goes into it. It's a lot of you know um, not making money at times mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, you really have to be passionate about it. I mean, I the road has been paved. You know, guys like yourself, the Nisswa Guide League, the uh, the Linders of the world, the Gary Roaches. The you know, the names are endless when it comes to Minnesota fishing legends and um, guys like that really paved the way for you know a younger generation like myself on and did it with class and and uh, you know you talk about sleeping in your cars and and you know I don't think it's that much more expensive than it was back then. Yeah, the price tag's gone up, but you know, um, back then guys weren't making that much money guiding either. And $12 so, for a half a day yeah. trip. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I do it because I love it. Um, I, I do it because I enjoy teaching people fishing. I enjoy fishing. I enjoy being out there. You know, there's so many times where I'm driving in my truck and it's a bright sunny day and I'm heading to the lake and you know, I just look up and say, you know, think how fortunate I am to be doing what I do and doing what I love doing. It's, I pinch myself all the time because it's, it truly is a dream uh, to be doing what I'm doing. And if, and if it weren't for, um, you know, guys that were legends in the industry that really paved the way, I, 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 I know I'd have a tougher road than I, I currently do, you know, trying to make a living in this industry. 
Where do your uh, customers come from, and do you basically operate alone, or do you have a, a crew of guys that work with you? I've got a, a crew of guys that I use um, summer and winter. You know, some um, they change from season to season. Uh, um, but I get people from all over the Midwest that want to come up and fish, and, and you know, fish walleyes. I get people from the Twin Cities that want to come up and fish. You know, uh, I'm sure like you, I get people that are corporate customers. You get people that are families. You get um, you know, I enjoy hopping in the boat with them because you, you always hear their story as well. And I like listening and hearing stories, people's different background. You get, as you know, people in your boat that are great anglers, that are fantastic anglers. You get other people that are novice. Some people want to learn a certain technique. For me, one, one uh, sector of my business that has been really growing over the last five to six, seven years is obviously ice fishing. That has really exploded as far as popularity. Um, and then bass fishing. Minnesota is really on the map now as a great destination for largemouth, smallmouth bass, Mille Lacs being a, um, a destination that now is, is known nationwide. And so um, I'm getting all sorts of people from down south that normally wouldn't come to Minnesota as tourists, but now are here because of our bass fishing and our catch rates, um, our size uh, rival a lot of locations across the country. And I don't, I think we're just now um, getting exposed to the rest of the country on how great a fisher we have, not just walleyes, but bass as well. What, what are the, uh, what's kind of the geographic range that you spend most of your time in? I know you fish Mille Lacs mm -hmm. a lot, but w what are some of the other area lakes that you fish? Um, <laughs> I love fishing Winnebagosh. Um, grew up fishing Winnie my whole life. Um, you know, the Grand Rapids area is great. Obviously Leech Lake. You know, we're blessed in Minnesota to have so many great fisheries. You know, mm -hmm. it's hard to, you know, pick one any given day. I, I always think the toughest question is um, the one that's posed to you, if you could only pick one lake or if you could only pick one species or one technique, because that's too hard. You know, I have little tiny streams and rivers that I fish around home that you can't get a boat in there. You've got to walk that stream, and I love doing that. I, um, I, I do that quite often. The upper Mississippi, north of Brainerd, Aiken area, um, all the way up to Grand Rapids, there's so much untouched water there that, you know, I don't think I'll ever get to fish in a lifetime. So I love fishing that. Um, to little backwoods um, lakes that you can only get into in the winter, um, I, I try to fish all over. I, I truly, uh, uh, I look at every day as a challenge. Um, every lake or body of water as a challenge. Doesn't matter what the species. Uh, you know, for business, my business, you know, because Mille Lacs is such a great tourism destination, the Brainerd area is such a great tour tourism destination, I try to pick those areas. Yeah, I certainly have customers that love to go to Winnebagosh because I took them up there at one point or love to go to Leech, but I don't actively promote or, or you know, have a, a business up on Leech, but I'll, I'll take some people up there or recommend them to some guides in that area as well and try to network. I think. Uh, a large part of our industry, you know, because it is so small, is networking with other people. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, in today's age, it seems like you can get information at the touch of a button. So it's nice to be able to, if, if someone hears about a hot bite somewhere, even if I can't take them somewhere, I can network with a guide on Leech or, or Winnie or Red mm -hmm. Lake or Lake of the Woods. Let's, let's talk a little bit about Mille Lacs because I know you're on the uh, general advisory board mm -hmm. or a council. Um, it, and it's been controversial in a, in a lot of different areas. And, you know, I, I've said this uh, on our program many times, I'm not a fish, fisheries biologist, and I can appreciate how difficult it is to figure out what's going on underwater. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a collapse on Leech Lake where for four years it was hard to even catch a perch sometimes, you know, and, and it was maybe because of the cormorants, maybe not. I mean, the, the jury's still out on some of these things, but Malich has rebounded, it's coming back, it's doing mm -hmm. a lot better. Um, Mille Lacs uh, was always held up there as probably the world's best reproductive area for, for walleyes. And I can remember fishing back there in the 60s, and, and it was just unbelievable uh, how many fish there were. And it's hard to pinpoint all of the things that are causing the issues there, but. From your perspective, are we making progress on that? Do you think we are understanding better what's happening on Mille Lacs? Yeah, you know, um, Mille Lacs is a, it's a big body of water. It's like Leech Lake. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a, um, 
a lot of things that have changed in that system over the last decade. I mean, you've got zebra mussels, you've got um, water temperatures change. Well, I mean, look at you know springs and falls. It seems like we've had earlier springs and later falls lately, and um, bait fish, you know, decline and, and rise. And so there's a lot of things going on in, in that fishery that um, you know a lot of moving parts, if you will. And yeah, I think we're going in the right direction. I mean, that 2,000 year 13 year class really gave a boost to the lake as far as overall numbers of fish you know prior to that the the big issue wasn't um, that there wasn't any walleyes it was just the spawning biomass was aging you know the 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 bigger fish were getting bigger and there wasn't a lot of small fish coming up through the system and uh, when you have that it's kind of scary because you look down the road and you take a, a, a natural spawning lake like Mille Lacs and all of a sudden you know, you can see in the future saying, hey, you know, in a couple of years, we're not going to have any small fish left. And uh, that's changed. You know, that 2013 year class, we get a big shot in the arm with that. You know, some of these year classes in between 14, 15 are okay. 16 looks really good. Um, back online again, as far as numbers. So yeah, I think we're heading in the right direction. Um, also, just uh, being on that board and having the board to um, talk through some issues rather than just meeting once a year and then kind of battling it out over you know what's going on in the lake because a lot of people have varying opinions you know you, you've got a lake that size with people that are very passionate about the lake um, you're going to have people with with really varying opinions on what's going on so it's nice to see um, this advisory board we meet once a month sometimes twice a month we not only talk about you know, we're, we're all pretty much conservation minded. We want to see this thing through. We want to see Mille Lacs succeed. Um, but you've got a really good mix of people that are uh, stakeholders in the lake um, that, that, you know, either own a business on the lake, a gas station around the lake, a bait shop. Um, you've got a good mix of people that are realtors, some people that are um, on different um, fishery boards, if you will. So you've got some people that are interested in bass. You've got people that are interested in northern pike populations, walleye. Um, you also have people on the board that are biologists, uh, uh, and then you have some people that are on the board that are, you know, um, on the board because they, you know, they're, they're, they're county advisors or they sit on a county seat. So they may not necessarily have a fishing background, but it's a good source and a good mix of people, um, some on the inside and some on the outside looking in. And I think that's really helping not only, um, you know, make sure that we see this thing through and and create a great fishery but also it's good in the relationship that we have with the minnesota dnr and seeing what they're looking at as biologists because like you said in the beginning it's it's hard to look under the water and see exactly what's going on especially when you're talking like a lake like Mille Lacs, leech winnebagosh lake of the woods it's it's uh it's a vast system out there and it, it looks easy on a map but when you actually get out there as you know it's it's uh, pretty intimidating at times it really is. You know, Red Lake, when Red Lake collapsed, we knew it was because of netting. Uh, Leech Lake collapsed. I don't know that we're still positive of all the reasons why Leech Lake collapsed, but it's coming back. But Mille Lacs collapse seemed to be the biggest mystery of all. I, and I think there was a lot of time just spent trying to understand why is this lake not recruiting young, they call it the recruiting mm -hmm. of the young fish. And uh, I, I personally, I think a lot of us have thought maybe they were just protecting too many large fish. Um, and I, I think the other thing that's never really talked about very much, and it's true on Mille Lacs, and it's true on Leech, and it's true on Red Lakes, we have been a part of the problem. Mm -hmm. There are so many fishermen when these bites are hot. Mm -hmm. um, I can remember them talking about 40,000 boats on Mille Lacs on a weekend. And I do remember the, the latter years when it was so hot, at some of the resorts, like on Terry's over on the southeast side of the lake or the east side of the lake, there wasn't even a place to go. You had to park in fields across the road. Yeah. So that many people with that much pressure is a, also a big factor. And it's true of a good hot crappie bite. I mean, the word gets out and the crappies are just about wiped out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so people are, are part of the problem. There's more and more of us. And if you look at the historic things happening in worldwide, uh, there is since 1970 we've lost almost 60 percent of our fish populations in the oceans and it's from people eating fish.
fish mm -hmm. as much as anything. So, but I know it's a very emotional thing. A lot of these folks have their businesses depend upon the tourism being there. The thing I've always appreciated about you, Tony, is when this collapse started, that smallmouth population was there. And you started promoting that more than anybody I heard mm -hmm. talking about, well, don't just focus on walleyes, get out here. And, and I think when they had the national uh, BASS tournament on the locks last year, they found out, wow, that is really a fisheries resource for smallmouth bass. And, you know, is that because the walleyes slimmed out? I, I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows, but we're starting to see that development on Leech Lake where there's a really good population of smallies. 20 years ago, I never caught a smallmouth bass on Leech mm -hmm. Lake, and now they're there too. But So our, our climate's changing, our um, lakes are changing, and it's it, we're just in a period of uncertainty, aren't we, with a lot of these things, I think. Yeah, you know, um, the studies will definitely show that bass populations, especially in this north country, are growing. You know, uh, growth rates are getting better. Um, the, the population's getting up there, but, you know, uh, the smallmouth in Mille Lacs have been really good for about a decade here. You know, mm -hmm. with the with the sport fishery that and and the really, um, you know, I don't know if the uh, the people out know that, uh, you know, Mille Lacs for a better part of ten to fifteen years was a closed fishery to smallmouth bass. You could keep one over twenty one, that was it. So it was basically a sport fishery. Well, in that time, you know, that the bass were there and. It just wasn't really talked about because walleye fishing was was the reason come, people come to Mille Lacs. I mean, you look in Garrison, there's a great big uh, walleye in Garrison. You don't hear anything about smallie fishing, and a lot of people knew that it was a great smallmouth fishery. And they I mean, didn't I always want people to know. Didn't they? <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I watched countless TV shows where I knew they were they were fishing and they were catching smallmouth bass. So it's been a great fishery for a while, but now, yeah, the cat's out of the bag. And the rest of the country knows now that it's a it's it's a world class bass destination, and people are coming from all over. I get people from Oklahoma, Texas, California, uh, some really good skilled anglers that are coming up here, and that are just in awe about how great of fishing we have in Minnesota. And as you know, Mille Lacs can be pretty rough, so there's times where I have to take them elsewhere. And we have a lot of other great bass fisheries around that they're amazed at. The, the the level of fishing we have for bass in the state of Minnesota and that gets overlooked because we have such great walleye fishing and we have great pike fishing and um, bass to us have been kind of that overlooked species and now I think it we're kind of in the national spotlight as Minnesotans as a whole. Yeah a lot of people have treated bass as if they were garbage fish uh, but if you've caught a 23, 24 inch smallie you know that that's a real thrill <laughs> right. to catch those things. And uh, But you're right, I, I've looked at some studies in Canada where the bass are moving about 10 miles a decade to the lakes north, mm -hmm. you know, and they're not always sure, is it people planting them there? They're not sure how they're getting them, maybe they're getting there through birds and eggs, I'm not sure, but there's definitely a sprawl of uh, smallies and largemouth bass, both. We only have about four minutes left, but maybe you could give us, going into this spring, a few a little year tips on how people might want to catch a walleye and then maybe we could talk a little sure. bit about bass before we run out of time. Yeah, no, um, you know, spring's always that time of year where, you know, um, it's kind of a time of renewal, if you will. Everybody, it's a fresh start for everybody in Minnesota. We have uh, Minnesota Fishing Opener for a reason and I always say play the weather. You know, if the weather's cold and nasty and, uh, you know, slow down, you know, shut that big motor off. You know, fish shallow, fish a little bit later in the afternoon. That's tend to win the fish bite. Um, you know, if it's a really warm spring, you can do a lot of things that other anglers aren't doing. Everybody's packed in on those shoreline breaks. A lot of times you can slip out a little bit deeper or move around a little bit and catch fish. But I always let the fish tell me how I'm going to fish. You know, I, I don't go out that particular day with any, you know, preconceived idea where I'm going to fish and I'm, gonna, I'm only going to fish there. I, I use my electronics. I try to move around. I check... First thing I look at is surface temperature. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that factor into how I'm going to fish that day. And um, if you pay attention to the wind, water temperature, uh, you know, your graph. Uh, if you catch a fish, put an icon down. Um, not only when you catch a fish, do you put an icon down. Look exactly how fast you were going. A lot of those things are going to contribute to people putting more fish in the boat. And that's how I fish. Every day is different. Uh, I don't 
have an idea, well, we pounded them there yesterday. Yeah, I may start there, but by the end of the day, I might be somewhere totally different. Are you uh, mostly live bait fishing or live bait rigging in the spring, or are you doing a lot of artificials too? Uh, a lot of jigs, uh, jigs and spot tails, um, do some rigging, but um, a lot of plastics. The, the further away from 50 degrees you get as far as 52, 53, 54, 55, I find that artificials work much better than live bait at times um, just because I can control that bait uh, like with a paddle tail or a swim bait for example I can rip that thing through you know dead vegetation that's laying down there through rocks I don't have to worry about my shiner breaking off there's so many times where when you're pitching live bait especially in the spring as you know those walleyes come up and grab at mid minnow people set the hook and all they see is you know scales coming off their hook well, with that paddle tail, even if you miss them, they're still chasing that bait, and then boom, they'll inhale that whole thing. So you get better hookup ratios a lot of times with plastics. So yeah, I'm a big believer in plastics, and that's just not for walleyes. I mean, panfish as well. I'm using less and less live bait every time I go out fishing. And with the rules and regs we're dealing with with live bait, it's just a natural trend, I think, to start moving in that direction. How about uh, largemouth bass? What's some of your favorite midsummer techniques for largemouth bass. I love top water. You know, we were talking Leech Lake. You get up on some of those flats on Leech Lake, but a lot of places in Minnesota where you've either got wild rice, you've got bulrushes, lily pads, uh, even open water applications. I love throwing top water, and I love throwing frogs. Um, Rapala makes a lot of great top water products, whether they be X Rap poppers, skitter walks. I love throwing top water. I mean, if, if I see a fish hit the top, I know at any given moment in my boat, there's a top water somewhere rigged up in my boat, in my rod locker, because I'm deploying that. And that's not just for smallmouth, largemouth, uh, even panfish at times. If there's a top water bite going, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> well, tell people how they can get a hold of you, Tony. Uh, they can go to roachesguideservice.com on the web. Um, also, you can Google Tony Roach Fishing, um, tonyroachoutdoors.com. Either way, you can contact me and spend a day on the water. Well, I think it would be a day spent with a guy that would be fun to fish with. So thank you for being on our show. Appreciate it very much. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ray. I appreciate it. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time.